All right, Taylor, we'll go ahead and get started here because I want to make sure we have time for all the Q&A and everything. Um, so for everyone who is joining us today, I'll do some quick rounds of introductions. Um, if you are joining us because you saw the sign up link uh, either on Sourcebooks Twitter or Overdrive's Twitter and you have no idea who you're looking at right now, uh, my name is Adam Sokol. I am one half of the Professional Book Nerds podcast with Joe Grunenwald, who is, I think, also on your screen, depending on how you're looking at it right now. Uh, we host the Pro Professional Book Nerds podcast, which is part of Overdrive, is presented by Overdrive. And we do episodes every Mondays and Thursdays. We do author interviews and book recommendations and all sorts of fun stuff. You can subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, but more importantly, today we are joined by New York Times bestselling author Kate Moore, who a long, long time ago was a guest on the podcast, like three or four years ago at this point. Um, yeah. you, you may know Kate from her incredible book, Radium Girls, um, which there is also a young adult version as well, which I realized was in the room I'm sitting in when I was doing research for this. Um, we are here to talk about Kate's new book, which comes out next week, I believe. Is that correct? The 23rd? That's right. Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, Very which exciting. is yeah which is called the woman they could not silence so oh that's there good. you go look at that i actually i have a copy of that somewhere in here too um so what we're gonna do today um a little bit different if you've joined us for these events we're gonna have kate do a little bit of a kind of like a 10 minute presentation about everything that uh that the book entails and then jill and i will ask some questions so kate i will stop talking and i'll let you take it away Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm so excited to be here today talking to you about my new book, The Woman They Could Not Silence, because this story, this story from history is just incredible. It has everything that I think Radium Girls had and more. It has courtroom drama. It's got dastardly villains, shocking scientific historic facts. Uh, it's got a twist of gothic horror as I take you inside the insane asylums of the 19th century. But above all, at its heart, this is the story of an empowered fight against enraging injustice, injustice that still resonates today. And it stars a compelling heroine, a woman whose incredible and inspirational journey has inspired me to write this book and who I think, whose sheer spirit will simply take your breath away. So allow me to introduce you to the woman they could not silence. Her name was Elizabeth Packard, but I suspect that many of you have never heard her name before because as often happens to feisty women who stand up for themselves, history has chosen instead to commemorate those men who tried but failed to silence her. So Elizabeth's story starts on the cusp of the American Civil War in June 1860. And it starts with Elizabeth, a 43 year old housewife and mother of six lying in bed in her marital home. It starts with a simple question. What would happen if your husband could commit you to an insane asylum just because you disagreed with him? That's what happens to Elizabeth, a fiercely intelligent woman who strongly believes I, though a woman, have just as good a right to my opinion as my husband has to his. But Elizabeth lives in a time where women are regularly committed for acts of self-assertion, even for simply reading novels. She lives in a time where the received scientific wisdom of the age said that simply being a woman meant you were at increased risk of going mad, so that a standard surgical treatment of the era was removal of the clitoris. I found in my research that one patient who endured that treatment was a 20 year old woman whose only so-called symptom of madness was that she liked to engage in serious reading, something that probably applies to all of us in this webinar and podcast right now. Elizabeth also lived in a time where the legal situation meant she was powerless. It was a law known as coverture, something inherited from England. So it seems we Brits have a lot to answer for. The law said the husband and the wife are one, and that one is the husband. It meant that married women had no rights to property, 
to their own earnings, to the custody of their children, even to their very liberty. By law, husbands could send their wives to asylums by request and specifically without the evidence of insanity that was required in other cases. This book is not only about Elizabeth's fight for freedom and her fight against these injustices, it's a book about her journey to find that unsilenceable voice as she moves from housewife to historically significant heroine, someone who successfully battles to improve the rights of women and the mentally ill. But make no mistake, though this is a history book, the issues at its heart could not be more modern. And that's actually how I came to this story. The story didn't start for me in the June of 1860. It started in the fall of 2017, when you might remember that all around us, there was the fire of the Me Too movement. Everywhere, women were speaking out and speaking up against sexual harassment, misogyny, rape. What really struck me about that powerful movement, however, was not that women were speaking up, because to be honest, we always have. It was that finally we were being listened to and believed. And what I was interested in about the movement was why hadn't it happened before now? What had taken so long? What had been the cage that had kept women trapped before? How had our words been devalued and discredited so that we've been silenced in the past when we tried to raise all these many issues? And as I sat at my kitchen table in London thinking about all these issues, my ideas and thoughts coalesced around a single realization. For centuries, whenever women have used our voices, we've been called crazy. And that is something that still happens to this day. Just this past summer, Vice President Kamala Harris was called a mad woman for the assertive way she conducted herself in the Senate. Think of Hillary Clinton when she ran for president. She was called hysteric. Probably everyone remembers that iconic picture of Nancy Pelosi in an electric blue suit standing up to Donald Trump. How did he react? He wrote on Twitter, there is something wrong with her upstairs. She is a very sick person. So these issues are still prevalent today and they're something that I wanted to write about. But I didn't want to write a polemic. I am at my heart a storyteller. And what I wanted to try and find was a story from history that would allow me to explore these issues, but through a narrative, through one woman's story. And so I went looking for Elizabeth. I didn't know her name. I didn't know what era from history I was going to find her in. But I knew that there would be a story out there. I fell down this rabbit warren of internet searches about women and madness. And on the 15th of January, 2018, I first read the name Elizabeth Packard. I fell down that rabbit hole into a University of Wisconsin essay. And I was reading it and four pages in, in a single paragraph, I read her name. I started looking into her story in more depth. And very quickly, I realized she was the one, the woman I wanted to write about next. Because what a woman she is. I can't tell you how resilient, how inspiring this woman is. She was so charismatic. She was so determined to express herself, to be herself, to find herself. And I hope that her story resonates with a lot of people because the journey she goes on is one that we can all emulate in a way. And she became this astonishing, inspiring person who changed the world. But as I started looking into her story, I realized that I was gonna be up against it because as I reached out to some of the librarians in some of her hometowns, some of them had never heard of her either. There is no Elizabeth Packard special collection where you can go and research her, which seems astonishing given how much she contributed to the reform movements of the 19th century. But what I did find were Elizabeth's own books. Because that journey to find her voice 
meant that she became a writer. Through the crucible of suffering, she found herself. She wrote, the worst that my enemies can do, they have done, and I fear them no more. I am now free to be true and honest. And so she used that freedom to find her voice. She published these books, books I draw on in my own book, so that we can hear from Elizabeth in first person about all the amazing things that happened to her. And she tells us with insight and emotion what it was really like to be her. Now, of course, my research took me much deeper and further than just her own books. And I want to finish just by telling you about, for me, one of the most powerful parts of my research trip, which was to go to the insane asylum where Elizabeth herself had been held. I walked past the stone gatepost that she herself had done. And they're really old now, as you'd imagine, the stone is crumbling and they're twice the height of a woman. And there's a real sense of crossing over, leaving civilization behind as you walk into what is now a community park. To my disappointment, the hospital itself had been demolished in 1984, so I couldn't actually visit it. But what I did find were auxiliary buildings left behind, and it was still haunting to peer through those windows to see the stalactites of unpeeling paint on the underside of the staircases, and to see the walls of these abandoned buildings that were graffitied, don't open, dead inside. But I think it is important to open the doors to the past, because through them step people like Elizabeth Packard, with her spirit as wide as her cage crinoline skirt. Elizabeth wrote, I will not set my light under a bushel. I will set it upon a candlestick so that it may give light to others. And I think the greatest legacy of Elizabeth Packard is not the laws that she changed or the way that she made the world better for millions of people. For me, her greatest legacy is that she sets an example for all of us. She wrote, women are made to fly and soar. And through her story, she teaches us all to fly. She teaches us that we can all become people who cannot be silenced. And through this book, her book, she shows us how. Thank you. I mean, we're gonna keep talking, but my <laughs> goodness, that is, uh, it's, that is such a, incredible presentation of this truly I, like unbelievable life that this human being lived. Well, thank, thank you. I have to say, I was keeping an eye on the clock because I could talk about Elizabeth all night and I was like, right, edit that bit, edit that bit. I <laughs> mean, if time. you want to, I was just like, go ahead, please. Just tell Genuine. me more. Just tell me more. And like, I, and I think I had to keep reminding myself, I mean, you, you know, you, you did say it in the presentation, but like, this is a true story. Like, this is not fiction. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I think that's a really important point to make, because as I say, I am a storyteller. And as with the Radium Girls, if people watching have read that too, I am writing history, but I do write almost as though it's a novel in the sense of I bring scenes to life I've looked up you know what was the weather yeah. like on that particular day so that I can say whether it was raining or foggy or whatever so I hope readers will be swept away by the story and in a way I think it's quite easy to forget that it's history and that it's true because you hopefully get swept up in the story that's my intention as a writer to you know, keep those pages turning, you know, in the dead of night, you, you don't want people to put the book down, you want them to keep turning the pages. But remember, you know, every quotation that I use in the book comes from a historical source made by someone who was present at the time. And as I say, what was a gift for this book was that Elizabeth herself published, she actually self-published, this was another part of her brilliance, uh, she actually crowdfunded her own works, you know, way ahead of her time. This is 1860 and she's crowdfunding. Yeah. Um, but it meant that, um, you know, she'd published memoirs essentially, which included, you know, conversations that she'd had with people. So for my book, bringing this to life as nonfiction, I've actually got dialogue in there that Elizabeth herself had recorded at the time. Um, so I really hope it does feel vibrant um, and you've got to remind yourself it is history. Yeah. I I feel like if you had written this as a fictional novel, people would read it and be like, this is not realistic. 
because it seems impossible what she had to go through. And I guess, you know, like, sometimes when we're talking about nonfiction, a lot of the, like, we'll ask questions about like, well, what made you want to write this story? I don't think we need to ask you what made you want to write this story. It feels pretty obvious, but I guess looking at it, when you're doing research for this one and for Radium Girls and, and any other like nonfiction kind of historical piece that you're working on, how do you know, I'm always interested in this, how do you know when to say like, okay, I have enough of the story or like, because I can't imagine there's any aspect of her life that you would want to omit, omit like, because every part of her story feels more extraordinary than the next, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the book itself needed a lot of editing, you know, let alone the research. Um, I totally over-delivered. I had to cut about 60,000 words. Uh, there was an original part one before, you know, where the book now starts, there was a part one before that, um, which I conceived as a kind of um, Arthur Miller crucible-esque witch hunt, you know, as the community turn against Elizabeth, you know, this strong woman in, in their midst. You know, it's not just her husband who's sending her to the asylum, but the parishioners from his parish, because her husband was a preacher, um, you know, they all turn against her. And I and that's what was in part one, basically, the way uh, she was sort of hunted down for being this independent, assertive woman. Um, but I, all of that had to go. Um, and equally, in the latter part of her life, I had to really um, contract uh, the part five as well. And it is to the book's benefit. But as you say, as I'm researching, I wanted to put everything in there and I've I've had to strip it back and strip it back as yeah. I go. <laughs> you, I'm, just, I'm just like in awe. You basically chopped an entire, entire book, book yeah. from yeah. this book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did the same with Radium Girls, actually. I think I, I'm just prone to over-delivering um, and then I have to put my editor's hat on. L mm -hmm. Luckily, I was an editor in a former life yeah. um, and put my editor's hat on and just go, no. It's, it's got to, it's got to go it's got to go but I mean I could see how you would get you know there's just this idea that um it wasn't it wasn't just her husband it was you know he sort of got these other people involved and I think it's interesting and probably intentional that you would use the word like the phrase witch hunt to describe it because that reminds me a lot of what happened during Salem is that women who were and men too you know who were just like didn't quite fit the expectations from the church of how they should act and behave were declared witches and, you know, bad things happen to them. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, you, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if Elizabeth had lived, you know, probably even 50 years earlier, you know, a hundred years earlier, she would have been called a witch. It was just in the 19th century insanity uh, was the new was the new witch witchery basically you know um, they weren't uh, burning women at the stake anymore they were locking them up in insane asylums um, and you're exactly right too in making the point that it was about women who didn't conform to society's expectations and I found it fascinating in researching the book in researching the medical journals of the time because there was something called moral insanity, which was basically, it was, it was literally defined as eccentricity of conduct. Well, who defines who's eccentric? Um, you know, in this case, it, it's generally white middle-class uh, Protestant men right. who were saying that anyone who acts out of their, you know, what they think of as, as the way to live your life, well, anyone who doesn't do that is mad. They're morally insane. Um, and that applied to men and women, incidentally. It wasn't just women who were being locked up. Uh, it was men as well, you know, perhaps particularly effeminate men, for example, who were perceived as not, uh, you know, as I say, being eccentric, not, mm -hmm. not acting in a natural way as they would have defined it. These people were also sent to insane asylums. One of the things that, I, I don't know what to say, takes my brother, but like just struck me is I when you read stories about the way like like Jill was talking about like the Salem witch trials and these moments in history where we're looking back we can say like that should never have happened of course and it's almost like people will look at it and say like well that's just the way that things were done then and it didn't make it okay but that that's how that it worked but what strikes me about this particular story is when she finally does have a trial with a jury and like this isn't 
I, 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 it's part of her story. And I think like, it doesn't give anything away, but like when they go through the whole process, even in that moment in history, the people who were her jurors, if they took like seven minutes to deliberate after she presented her case and they're like, no, she's not crazy. This, this is, how did this happen? Like it is her husband's actions were so extreme that even in that moment in time, the jurors were like, no, this, what, what are we talking about here? Yeah. But I, but I think what is really haunting is as I've been, even as I've been researching and talking about this book, you know, as I've been telling people what I'm working on and what's coming out, I've heard stories, you know, within living memory of the same thing happening to women, you know, husbands sending, getting their life, their wives locked up, you know, putting them under involuntary psychiatric care, almost as a form of domestic abuse, mm -hmm. you know, women who, you know, wives who were not doing what their husbands wanted. I'm talking about the 1980s. You know, I've literally spoken to women to whom that has happened. Uh, and it's just chilling to think that it can still happen because it does. Yeah, it just, yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I have so many feelings. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think it's interesting that so far we've sort of talked about um, the, the church's element in this since Elizabeth's, you know, husband was a, um, a, uh, a pastor. And yet, you know, I can think of both F. Scott Fitzgerald and T.S. Eliot like sent their wives away too. It's not... So I feel like it's important to sort of not just put it on that particular element that, yeah, yeah there are well-known men um, in literature at least and elsewhere who have, who have done this to their wives. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and the, the fact that I'm thinking, like, looking through Elizabeth's story, it's not even that she was this type of person who was against the concept of the church and God, it, it was more so that she was just like, yeah, I just want to have my own relationship with this higher power and her husband being like, no, that's not how this is supposed to work. Like there is, I don't know. It's just, to me, it's so. Yeah. Ludicrous. Funnily enough, when you bring that, that up as an upset that there was, when I was doing my, re well, I say I was doing my research. It wasn't really research. I was watching the first series of The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> um, and there's a line in that, uh, where uh, the husband and wife characters are talking um, and the husband says something like, you answer to me and I answer to God. And that essentially was the dynamic that Theophilus, Elizabeth's husband, wanted to have, that everything was channeled through him. And that even wasn't just him, that was a lot of uh, the preachers of that time. Mm -hmm. And what I found interesting researching is that a lot of the uh, religious ideas that Elizabeth had for which her husband was just outraged actually his own church then adopted them later in the 19th century she was just ahead of her time in mm -hmm. raising them as you know theological ideas mm -hmm. you know she herself acknowledged that she said my problem is I'm about 25 years ahead of my contemporaries actually she was even further than that you know she writes in her in her books about wanting a female president you know we're still waiting uh, for that 160 years on one of the things uh, that strike I, one of the things that strikes me is how this is a poor turn of phrase so i apologize in advance but how she's able to kind of keep her wits and like remain calm and throughout because when people read your book they'll they'll say that not only was she in this insane asylum for three years and writing while she was there she then when she eventually leaves and goes back and lives with her husband she lock he locks her up in a room and like throughout this whole thing and then she eventually gets to her trial and like there's these several times throughout her story where she has to present her case and it's almost like she just the awareness she has to to know okay they are going to do everything they can to make me look like an insane woman, like a witch, mm. like all these different things. Like, I don't know. I thinking about how I get frustrated if like the lettuce I buy is bad, you know, and like how she's able to keep her wits, like while reading through everything that she put together, like did, was there ever a sense 
in her her own mind or in her writing that she was very aware like of how she had to present herself did, did that come through yeah ab- absolutely she she talks about this um fortress of self-composure that she has um and she maintained that throughout um and she you know she's very confident actually when she first gets to the asylum that she'll be quickly be released because she knows she's not going to act in a mad way you know she's she's going to keep her wits about her as you say she's going to keep calm she's not going to lose her temper because angry women are obviously you know completely certifiable um so yeah no she she very overtly talks about the way that she has to keep a hold on herself um, in order to not be accused uh, of madness. Uh, and I think uh, it's relevant to sort of mention the first line of the book, actually, which is, if she screamed, she sealed her fate. You know, any time a woman uses her voice, expresses passion, um, you know, the chances are she's going to seal her fate. And I think that is completely tied into Elizabeth's story. Yeah, I mean, that's still, as you said, like, women using their voices or acting in a certain way like we still to this day women everywhere can attest that there are just certain behaviors you should not have or you have to like mask yourself in order to like essentially pass as not crazy and it's weaponized in such an awful way and you know, it's worse for women of color and it's just, it, it makes me really like angry. Like I'm not, trying, I'm just like mad. It is. And, and I think actually it is a book that will make people angry because it, because yes. it, it raises all these infuriating and enraging issues. Um, and, you know, my husband sort of said, you know, Radium Girls is, is a book to break your heart, but the woman they could not silence is a book to get you angry um you know and 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 hopefully you know want to go out and and campaign and uh you know correct these injustices if we can because the more people are aware of them then you might question if that allegation of insanity is flung around you know you might feel more confident to stand up for yourself the way that elizabeth did um you know so i i think it's i hope that people are enraged by it because it is enraging while i'm thinking of Speaking of Radium Girls, you know, one of the major results from that book, uh, uh, from the, the, the women that you wrote about, was basically revolutionizing workers' rights and, you know, factory, you know, like the laws that, that were put into place about all of this. Can you maybe touch on for our listeners some of the things that Elizabeth her work led to that were still I'm trying to trying to think of like the positive yeah. side of things that yeah no, was- absolutely and there is a positive you know actually one of the reasons I chose to write about Elizabeth is because there is a happy ending so yeah. you know do, do persevere with it it's you know she's a strong woman it's it's going to be okay um but yes no her legacy is extraordinary and um, she became a political campaigner and she campaigned for the rights of women and the rights of the mentally ill uh, and it's quite striking that she found it easier to get uh, legislation through when it was about protecting the mentally ill it was a much harder fight uh, to gain greater freedoms for women uh, but she did for example uh, you know she contributed to passing laws about women you know being able to retain possession of their own earnings Uh, That was one of her campaigns. In terms of the mentally ill, uh, she was integral in ensuring, for example, that inspections of asylums took place because before Elizabeth uh, was campaigning, the doctors had supreme power uh, and they sort of ran them as these sort of patriarchal households. And in the same way that, um, you know, a father of a household would not expect there to be any oversight. It was the same for the doctors. They felt they should have the, you know, absolute authority to, you know, govern and control all the people under their care or control. Um, But thanks to Elizabeth, she pointed out that, you know, this this isn't good enough. Um, And actually that power can corrupt. Um, And so she was integral in getting inspections of asylums Uh, In some states, she was even successful in insisting that a woman should be on the board. 
Um, and she also passed laws, for example, that patients should have access to their own mail uh, because at the time she was in the asylum, there was censorship. So she, you know, people would write to her and she wouldn't get the letters. She would try and write to them and they wouldn't be sent. Um, and so she uh, campaigned for laws to stop that happening so that, you know, if there were any unjust commitments of which there were hundreds, at least people could get letters out to lawyers to try to launch uh, an appeal, for example. This is one of those books where I almost feel like as I'm reading it, I feel just like on principle, I should like apologize for being a male. Like it's like so infuriating how these men. <laughs> I... It, well, it is, it, is, it is absolutely. But and, and again, not, not to keep half about radio, but as with radio, else, there are good men in the book, too. You know, sure. Samuel Sewell is um, a great man. He, he was a, an abolitionist and a women's rights campaigner, a lawyer um, from Massachusetts. Um, he helped Elizabeth with her campaigns. You know, she had a lawyer called Stephen Moore, who was, uh, by all accounts, this incredible character who liked, uh, you know, practical jokes and hunting and had this really long beard. Um, I loved reading about him as I was researching him. Uh, he acted, uh, you know, without taking any money from Elizabeth, simply because he felt it was the right thing to do to help this, you know, helpless, penniless woman who'd been so oppressed. You know, he acted for her in the courtroom drama that is in the book, you know, completely for free uh, because he he wanted to support Elizabeth and to support women in such situations. I keep um, thinking about how, you know, you, you had said that it was sort of easier for her to advocate and get resources for the mentally ill versus for women. Um, you know, and I still think, again, like this book, despite the time period, that she lived there are so many things that are applicable today and you know having like regardless of her own mental health status you know and how asylums were basically used as just like a place to like throw people to get them out of the way um having access to mental health resources is so important now especially when you consider that there was no oversight in those asylums and you know i think movies and media we have this like idea of what those institutions were like at that time they were like a lot worse than what they like it, it was even worse than that and it's just it's just to, it, to think about the people who did need that help and were just like had had nothing and we're just like left yeah helpless. I, mean, I mean historians actually say you can trace you know campaigns for advocacy for mental health back to Elizabeth you know she's one of the ma matriarchs of the work we see being done today where we are thankfully talking about mm -hmm. mental health and you know people are now you know getting support that they need and it's support that isn't just throw them away and you know lock them up and throw away the key you know Elizabeth was part of what we benefit from today in you know talking about mental health you know because even though she herself was sane she saw people in the asylum you know obviously it, it wasn't just a receptacle you know people with depression were there um, you know people with genuine mental health problems were there and another thing that Elizabeth uh, did and that was key was that she saw the humanity of those people you know she didn't think of them as beasts which is how you know a lot of people thought of inmates of an asylum at that time you know there was something such as asylum tourism where people would literally go you know to see the mad people rave uh in the asylums you know elizabeth would look at someone raving and think there's a reason for that you know it, it's someone trying to express something she would see the humanity in that person she would want to listen to what they had to say and usually it was about and i think this is still true today you know powerlessness leads to problems with your mental health you know, that's the long and short of it. Um, you know, if you have no power, if you have no control, that's a really hard thing to get your head around and, you know, not be worn down by it. Uh, so, yeah, so I think the other thing that Elizabeth did, which has stood the test of time and that, you know, was an important legacy of her was to treat people who were mentally ill with humanity, with kindness, uh, with a sense that they were deserving of human rights. Uh, they did have a right to complain about abuse. They did have a right to have a voice, you know, before her that, you know, none of that was happening. Uh, and she was brilliant at giving them a voice and raising those issues in the public mind. Um, 
just for everyone listening, I, I, we kind of forgot to say at the beginning, and it's on me. If you have questions, you can type them in the, the chat and Q&A and everything, and we'll, we'll ask them. But um, speaking of her time in this asylum, while you were doing your research, did, did it seem like there was any indication that she was very aware of the fact that anything she said or did could be judged as, it, as proof of her mental state? Because it's, it seems like if she were to disagree with something that her husband said or something that one of the doctors said they could easily just say like we'll see she's she's insane like did did you have any indication of you know if she was aware of how every action she was performing or everything she said what could be held against her and then like maybe how she used that to help convey you know how like what her mental state actually was yeah um yeah she was definitely aware and I I, I think I think it's actually a key part of her journey because she goes into the asylum and she talks of uh, the crushing scrutiny that she'd been under within her community, you know, scrutiny that continues from the doctors when she's in the asylum. And she talks about how, um, you know, every every look, every tone of the voice, um, you know, every action, everything she says uh, can be twisted to make her seem insane and that's very true you know um the evidence from her neighbors for example talked of her evidence of elizabeth's madness was when she shouted at her husband for not having cleaned the yard uh you know so it, even simple simple domestic tiffs like that you know elizabeth was seen as mad because she stood up to her husband she asserted herself she raised her voice um you know, and she was very aware of that going into the asylum. She talked, as I mentioned earlier, about this fortress of self-composure, wanting not to express herself in the asylum for fear that it would mean she would stay there. But part of her journey is that she, you know, reaches a point where she's like, you know what, I'm just going to be myself now. I am going to challenge the doctors about the abuse that I'm witnessing in the asylum. I am going to you know, speak out against my husband. I am, you know, because part of what was supposed to happen in asylums was that these troublesome uh, women, you know, these women who had what they called ungovernable personalities, part of their treatment was that they were supposed to learn to submit to masculine authority. The doctors were almost ciphers for the husbands. You know, if they could, if the women could learn to submit to the doctors, then they could send them home, you know, knowing that the husband would then take over as the controlling figure in her life. And, you know, she would be cured from her madness. But Elizabeth would say, you know, for me to want to go back to my husband, that would be madness, given the way he has treated me. Um, and then there does come a point in her story where she articulates that and sticks to it, you know, doctor dr mcfarland who is the, the doctor in elizabeth's case you know he's writing his notes which i was able to draw on in the book as well so it's not just a one-sided story i've got both sides of the story in there um you know he's saying you know her hatred of her husband had something diabolical about it but elizabeth would have would have arguments with the doctor saying you know it is madness for me not to hate him he has sent me away from my children you know she had an 18 month old baby when she was sent away uh, she's a mother of six, she's sent away from her children, sent away from her home, the home that she's poured everything into because she's not allowed to go anywhere but the home. So, you know, Elizabeth's a woman that, you know, doesn't half do anything. She's a brilliant seamstress. She's an amazing cook. You know, she's created this gorgeous house and home for her family. She's sent away from it. She's sent away from her children. You know, he's robbed her of everything, you know, including her reputation for sanity. And she's like, you want me to go back with him? You want me to express love for this man? You know, that would be madness. Uh, and of course, the doctors don't agree with it. But uh, she does eventually reach a point where she's just like, you know what? I, I you know, I'm going to tell it like it is, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, for me, part of the inspirational you know, aspect of her journey and what I really connect with and what I love about the book. You know, it's not just the story of what happened to Elizabeth in terms of a sane woman going to an asylum. It is this journey that she goes on from mm -hmm. being what was, you know, actually a housewife who largely obeyed the societal rules. And actually, as she put it, this woman crushing machinery works the wrong way on me. You know, the true woman shines brighter and brighter under the process instead of being strangled. 
And I love that actually, you know, she, her spirit got stronger and stronger. The more they tried to crush her, uh, the stronger that she became. And I find that really inspirational. Such an incredible human being. I, um, we had a, a message here from Rachel who, who mentioned uh, something similar happened to my mom when I was young. She was forced to have electric shock, shock treatment several times and came out like a zombie. I remember visiting her when I was about six. I'm 56 now. She was never the same. And after that, terrible violent moods and depression was not surprising, really. Uh, she went in for postpartum depression. Uh, so that was actually something just to kind of follow up about being in the insane asylum. But I was, was this the type of facility, for lack of a better word, where they would, they were, they were doing stuff like lobotomies and shock therapy and, and different things that we've like like Joe was talking about the the versions of asylums that we see yeah in. and a actually both those treatments came later in history um so they weren't invented at the time that Elizabeth uh was in the asylum and in her specific asylum uh there wasn't really much treatment at all um they gave the patients a little ale uh there were some drugs um she talks about the doctor's laying on of hands, uh, which was basically his desire to create an intimate relationship with his patients. That was partly how he conducted his treatment. Um, so in Elizabeth's specific institution, uh, there weren't these you know, horrific treatments as they partly because of the historic timeline, but it doesn't mean that because there weren't lobotomies and electric shock therapy, doesn't mean there weren't awful things happening um and that for me was I think perhaps the most shocking thing that I uncovered in my research that I hadn't known about before is that when women um were seen as mad uh doctors at the time thought it was often because of their sexual organs so as I mentioned in the presentation right at the top of the podcast one of the surgical treatments of the era was something called a clitoridectomy you know, what we would today call female genital mutilation, you know, and patients would literally have their clitorises cut off or their ovaries removed. That was another treatment simply because someone thought they were mad. But if you look into why they thought they were mad, it's things like reading. It's things like women, you know, having distaste for the society of her husband, uh, to quote from one of the medical notes. Uh, a woman who, you know, had several miscarriages was deemed mad and had a clitoridectomy. Um, you know, for me, a really, really shocking thing to uncover because I certainly didn't know about it before. Um, and also in even in the Western world, it kept happening right up until the 1940s. In the research I did, it said the last recorded case was on a five year old girl in the 1940s. And I just find that chilling. And it was used to correct emotional disorder. Um, and it, yeah, I, I found that horrifying. So it may not have been the, you know, electric shock therapies that we're familiar yeah. with from film and TV and other literature on this topic. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that there wasn't some truly horrifying stuff happening and going on. Yeah, that I was... I was not aware of that at all. Like I'm, I'm familiar with sort of the concept of hysteria and like, you know, like the manual manipulation that doctors would do that came later, but that this was going on earlier than that and then still continued is rather horrifying. Yeah, completely. <sighs> um, okay, Elaine. well, I, you know, we usually, I don't want to, Jill, I don't want to cut you off, but that was going to kind of ask the last question that we usually ask if that's, Okay. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, so uh, this is probably somewhat straightforward in this one, but I still want to ask anyway. We always ask at the end of our podcasting, what do you hope readers take away from reading this book? Well, I hope it I hope I hope they fall in love with Elizabeth and recognize her legacy because she's been unfairly forgotten. So I would say number one. I want to restore Elizabeth's reputation and I want people to be aware of what she went through and what she achieved and how extraordinary she was to come through that suffering, uh, you know, so strong. Um, I think she's incredible and I want people to know her name and to know her story. Um, I hope they think about the issues that I've raised in terms of 
the weaponization of women's mental health, the way that's used to silence and discredit us. And I hope it makes them think about that. And finally, I hope they are inspired by Elizabeth in their own lives. Mm -hmm. um, a quote that really sort of resonated with me uh, came from quite an early part in the book. So in the summer of 1816, and Elizabeth wrote, she was in a Bible class um, to which she was hesitantly contributing, you know, very start of her journey. And she said, I felt so small somehow, as though nothing I said was hardly worth saying or hearing. And I know I've been that woman in work meetings before, you know, almost scared to express an opinion or to say what I think, to raise an idea. I think it is something that will resonate with a lot of people. But I hope if you read this book and you read Elizabeth's story, you see that she did it. You know, she went on that journey from that small, scared person to someone with this unsilenceable voice. And I hope it inspires people in their own lives to find the strength to speak out about whatever it is they want to speak about. about. Because I think if Elizabeth can do it with everything that she had stacked against her, you know, if Elizabeth can do it, then so can you. That is perfect. Um, so for everyone that is tuned in today, I'll give you a few different things you can do. One, you can go to Kate's website, which is kate-more.com, and you can pre-order her book there if you would like to purchase a copy. Or you can go, if you are a Overdrive or a Libby user, you can place the book on hold if your library has it. And if not, you can recommend that they add copies of it. Highly, highly recommend. The book is stunning. It is, like Kate said, extremely important. Um, and of course, to a lesser extent, but if you want to do this too, you can, of course, subscribe to our podcast. It's just professional book nerds. Um, thank you, everyone. We will stay on for another minute and in case people have questions. We, you can send it on through the chat. But if not, thank you for joining us today. And most importantly, Kate, thank you for writing. Thank you. Book. Thank you so much. I, I just feel so blessed to have the opportunity to talk to you about her. So thank you so much for inviting me on. And thank you for all you do to promote books and, you know, get people thinking and reading. Um, it's really invaluable. So thank you for your work. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. If you're going to sign off, have a wonderful day. Um, yeah. Thanks, everybody.